Hello there, and a very warm welcome to the very first episode of Chizingra Chats, the show where we take a stroll through the life stories of people in the Pokemon community, discovering the six Pokemon on their dream team along the way. I'm Charlie Merriman, otherwise known as Chizingra, a host and commentator for the Pokemon Video Game Championship series, and as of right now, a content creator <laughs> with this episode. So thank you for joining me for this. And it is my honor to have as my very first guest on the podcast, the one and only lovely man, Lee Provost. Lee, how are you? I'm doing good, Charlie. Honestly, thank you so much for having me on today. It's, uh, it is an absolute privilege, especially to be guest number one as well. I'm very excited, mate. And Honor is all mine, honestly. We could keep going back and forth like this uh, for the whole episode, being British <laughs> and uh, complimenting each other. But uh, no, it's um, there was no one else I wanted to be my first guest on the show. So, Lee, for um, people who might not be so familiar with you, can you give just a brief introduction? Yeah, my name is Lee Provost. Also, online handle is Osiris. So I am a content creator, and I also I am an official caster for the Pokemon uh, team for the VG side of things. So I've been commentating since two thousand and eighteen, um, and still going hopefully strong right now. <laughs> still having a lot of fun with it. Um, and obviously before that, I uh, was a very avid competitive player as well. So uh, have played competitive pokemon for a very long time this is how lee and i know each other through the casting scene and uh, we've cast a couple of events together haven't we lee most recently yes. european international championships early april 2024 um and of course because we're recording now we don't know how those went so <laughs> we're looking forward <laughs> looking forward to discovering what went down there uh and a special shout out side note before we get going lee um which is the fact that I owe the music and the art for the podcast to you. Now, again, we don't know yet how that's turned out because <laughs> we're still Could be terrible. <laughs> still finalizing that. But I'm assuming that I'm thanking you for your excellent work <laughs> on the art and the music for the podcast. There's no so. pressure on me now to, to <laughs> make an extra good job of it. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm getting my confidence. I'm just going to say you're welcome, Charlie, and I'm, I hope you're happy with it. <laughs> I have no doubt that I will be. But uh, yes, a personal thank you for that. And what better way of saying thank you than having you as the very first guest <laughs> on the podcast. So, yeah, the real reason is I bribed Charlie. I said, yeah, if you want me <laughs> to do this, then I have to be your first guest. On. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, to be honest, I would have said entirely fair enough. Um, so let's get to know you a little bit better, Lee, and let's get to know your six Pokemon. And the first thing that we're going to talk about is, you know, you've talked about, you, you've mentioned very briefly there, your competitive uh, leaning towards Pokemon. So I believe the first thing you're going to talk about is your very first tournament. Yeah, so wow, this is this is going right back. So the for those of you that don't know, into the VG scene recently or more recently, the very first Pokemon tournament held ever was in 2001. Uh, it wasn't run by Play Pokemon. That wasn't a thing back then. So it was run by um, Nintendo. And it was run all around the world with players from America competing at regional championships in Europe, uh, in the UK, and even places like Australia. And then you attended your regional championship event and then you qualified for your national. And then you, if you got to the final and you won, then you got a trip to the world championships. Uh, there was European championships in, in between that. But yeah, so that was my first tournament ever where I was um, 13 at the time. And my local uh, mall, which was the Metro Center in Gateshead, was holding one of these regional championships and uh, i managed to get a spot there and, and go up and it was single elimination and it was uh oh, stadium cup rules so for those of you who don't know it was singles you bring a team of six and you use three to battle with and uh, every round you got paired up with someone random you got given times when you got there for your next round uh with your opponent and then you turned up and you played on pokemon stadium if you progressed, you got a gym badge and you got through to the next round. And uh, I made it all the way to the semi-finals of the tournament uh, before I got knocked out. And it was 
the step before. So if I'd made it through that round, I would have got to the finals. And then also the two finalists got an invite to the, the national championships. So I got so close to getting an invite to the national championships down in London. Um, and I was so, so gutted when I lost. Um, and I didn't know anything about competitive Pokemon back then. I mean, my po my, <laughs> my team had like a Gengar on it with, and my, my main strategy with the Gengar was to hypnosis things and then use Dream Eater. Mm. <laughs> um, my hypnosis is hit that day quite regularly. I mean, Zapdos <laughs> as well. Venusaur I had on there. Clefable was another one. I think Articuno. The, the team was just an amalgamation of Pokemon I liked that I got on the game that I thought were good, but had no cohesion or anything like that. So <laughs> that's where it all began. Um, and honestly, I, I've never been so, like, I was so excited to go to the tournament and play um, and got so far as well. And then to come so close and fall short of that national championship win. And I remember my mum uh, coming to collect me. Uh, at the end of the tournament when it finished and I, I literally I don't think I spoke to anyone for like a whole day and the first thing I did when I got home was get on my I booted up Pokemon Stadium and the guy that beat me in the semi-finals used the star me with like it was like bolt beam combination <laughs> with psychic and it just absolutely obliterated my entire team I had no answers to it and I was like I've got to get myself a star me then that's why I did that night that night I got home before I went to bed was literally go catch a star you and train it up in the Elite Four a bunch of times, run through it to level 100, and then get the moveset perfect. And then there it was. And I was like, right, I'm ready for next time. <laughs> well, be nice. that was the training, but <laughs> obviously. <laughs> that is was... fascinating. I mean, there's so much to unpack there. But I mean, first of all, just what you said just then, the fact that you didn't just go home and just sort of do something else and sleep, it shows how devoted you were to doing that. You went straight in to get that star, mate and level it up so i you know i respect you for doing that but then um also the fact that you just threw a team together and then made it all that way I mean, that's amazing right uh when i look back i think yeah a lot of it i mean i think the the competition back then was a lot different to what it is now the bar is so much higher like on an average player but i remember i i remember i like one of the rounds i think when you first got in so my quarter final match was all the quarterfinals from that stage on were played on stage and they had I mean, they made it look really nice they had big leather seats and they had uh, a nintendo 64 and they had gold i always remember they had like gold n64 controllers like this is the coolest thing ever to be playing <laughs> with a gold n64 controller uh, but my opponent was like a, a full grown bloke and i was like why are you here? <laughs> but it would be like, uh, you know, so, uh, like a kid playing me now, but I have still right, yeah. tournaments. Now, right? <laughs> so I think about it like that, you know, but um, yeah, I remember some of the matches that I had, there was some like tough ones, some close calls, but the, the majority, it was like, as far as I can remember, were pretty clean sweeps apart from that semi-final match where mm. I got absolutely bodied. Um <laughs> And I guess it's those, and I think it was really that, that was what sparked my kind of, my, the fire really for wanting to continue to play competitive Pokemon. I kind of knew that that was, that's all I wanted to do. I really, I loved it so much. That was probably what really kept me in Pokemon. I love Pokemon, of course, kind of from the anime when I first got introduced to it and the games, of course, as well, when I started playing those. But I think the tournament side of it just had a different draw to to it than anything else that i'd ever ever played before and i just instantly fell in love with it well that's a great launch pad for now going into what your first pokemon would be on your dream team so the aim for lee here is not to build the best team but just to choose pokemon that are special to him in some way and lee's decided this in advance i have no idea what they are so let's find out lee what's the first pokemon on your dream team couldn't be anything else it has it for those of you that know me you will know this pokemon you probably be able to guess but it has to be tyranitar mm. has to be it's my number one pokemon it has to always be number one uh, i i just love tyranitar it's brilliant i ever since i it was introduced in gen 2 it was just such a monster pokemon it was it was very cool and on top of that there's special reasons for it every team that i've had really good tournament results with as well throughout the years that i've been playing it's always been a mainstay on my team. It's always been one of the, the MVPs on my team. And I've always, it's been like the reliable Pokemon I can always go to. And I feel like 
very comfortable with it. Even mm-hmm. though a lot of the builds that I've played in those teams have been quite different. Um, yeah. I don't think there could have even been another Pokemon there. Always mm. has to be Tyranitar. Good for you. I mean, it's great to hear that it's the um, the crossover between a Pokemon you really like and also one that you then decided to use competitively. Yeah. It's, yeah, because it's it, the design of it. Because there's some Pokemon that I, I like competitively, of course, but the design I'm not, like, massively in love with. But mm-hmm. I think it's just everything. Tyranitar's got everything. It looks amazing it looks like it's a very strong pokemon and it is a very strong pokemon mm. it's you know kind of pseudo legendary almost um yeah 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 and yeah it's got rock slide and back <laughs> in the day rock slide was it still is a strong move but yeah it was it's a very strong it's got lots of different options as well and it's so good defensively with that mm. sandstorm i think that's one of its big kind of draws to it so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. well that's a fantastic first option um how old would you have been when you started playing Pokemon? Uh, so it would have been like 12, 13 when I started first playing. And okay. then, yeah, that, yeah. Yeah, so probably 12. And then that tournament, yeah, so 99. Yeah, it would have probably been late. I reckon September time of that year. So after my birthday time. Mm. Um, and then that tournament there was 13, coming up 14. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, probably not as young as some people playing red and blue then, but I yeah I just, yeah I was gonna say I remember I because I, I remember at the time um I started uh the in northeast we have we don't have secondary schools uh in the northeast like you do down south so we have like uh first middle and then high hmm. so I would started like just just before I started high um my brother would be in middle still so he used to get like longer at home so i'd leave before him and mm. uh he always used to tell me about this show that he was watching it's like you need to you need to watch this show i've been watching in the mornings called pokemon i was like what and um i remember one morning i was sick so i got to stay home and he was like oh you can watch it with me this morning when he was having his breakfast and i remember it was like pokemon was on the tv and i was like what is this this is awesome um and then i got a nintendo magazine that my parents used to get me and uh in there was an article about this new game that was like huge in japan that was releasing soon in the uk and i remember going down to my local computer shop in the town where i lived and uh, they had it in on the release day it was meant to come out so i bought pokemon red and um yeah that was that was it booted my game boy up and <laughs> never never looked back really from that point it was um yeah like yeah just i and i played it so much at the time i remember when i was in like class and stuff at school and i'd have i'd be I'd, i honestly feel like I'd, my game boy was on in my bag because i could hear the music the in-game music and it was literally i used to walk to school playing it i, I never put it down i was like so hooked on it wow so. um that, so wow that must have been a real <laughs> light bulb moment when you watch with your does your brother still play now he does yeah yeah um he not, not he never got into competitive like i did which was unfortunate because i think there was definitely potential there yeah and he loves battling as well so i'm always like uh you you would have really had such a great time but he's just never never taken the dive to an event you never know there's still time now yeah I think maybe still persuade him but it was great when we were younger because we always had that kind of ca- camaraderie where we, we would build teams separately and then battle and test them you know mm. but it was it nothing like what you kind of have today but it was a kind of like a semi uh always that rivalry between us and uh still yeah. got it now because i mean i'm going to visit him soon and see my parents and he's like i've built a team and it's awesome and i'm, <laughs> I'm gonna beat you and i'm like okay well <laughs> let's see let's see because the last time it didn't go well for you <laughs> <laughs> that's so good here um <laughs> so essentially your brother introduced you to pokemon but you really picked it up and ran with it yeah pretty much yeah yeah <laughs> yeah okay um but that leads us on to especially because you were talking about tyranitar who said that then you did a tournament that was played within gold and silver which were the games that tyranitar was first introduced yeah so this leads on from that 20 uh 2001 tournament so that finished and then the the world championships played out and uh in fact uh, a uk player who won um uk nationals and then 
placed second, I think, at the European tournament, went over and actually won the whole World Championships down Van Varen. And then they did a tour with Nintendo after that championships had finished in Australia. And it was like a tour with Nintendo official magazine and Darren. And you could go along to the tournament. They did a bunch of stops around the UK and you had to beat like five random trainers at the event. And then you got the choice to battle Darren or the expert from the Nintendo magazine, Dave. Um, and I, of course, chose Darren because I was like, I don't know. I don't want to battle this Dave guy from the magazine. <laughs> like, I want to battle the world champion. <laughs> so uh, I battled Darren and it was, wasn't really an, a real battle. So you, you both used like uh, your strongest Pokemon. So Darren was using Mewtwo. So I was like, well, I'm going to use Mewtwo as well. Um, and yeah, Frozy's Mewtwo and the, the mechanics back in Gen 1. <laughs> kind of bust with freeze compared to <laughs> like even more than they are now so that was pretty much a game for him and uh, I, I i claimed my victory proudly with that hacks there uh, but he was really nice a lot older at the time than me but um that's how i got introduced to competitive pokemon he we got chatting afterwards and he's like do you go on these sites and i was like i have no idea what you're talking about and he wrote down uh, a bunch of websites for me to to go and he said Go here. This is my username. If you want to chat anytime, um, and you can you can learn about competitive Pokemon and and any anything like that. And uh, there's battle simulators online that you can test teams and stuff with, which was like wow, mind blown at the time. Uh, so that forum's still active. Actually, it's um, called Azure Heights. If anyone's interested to go and have a look at that, there's all the old posts from right back in the day. Uh, which is really interesting. Uh, so that's pretty much how I got introduced to competitive Pokemon. And I, that's how I started learning about actually building teams and the synergy of teams and things like that. And then that led into gold and silver. And because I had that spark ignited from that very first tournament in 2001, I was desperate for another chance, another tournament to go and try and, and do better because I'm so much better now because I understand the game a lot better than I did when I went to that tournament with my Dream Eater Gengar. And <laughs> so uh, there, was a, there was a tournament advertised in Nintendo Magazine again for um, just pre the release of Pokemon Crystal, but it was going to be held on Pokemon Gold and Silver. There wasn't many details for it and there wasn't as many stops around the UK, but they had four destinations or five destinations around the UK. It was called the Celebi Tour. And I remember talking to my brother and we were both like we've got to go to this but the nearest point sorry my camera is <laughs> deciding to not focus on that there we go there we go so talking to my brother and he was like we've got to go to this tournament we both built teams in gold and silver and we were like pretty confident that we could do well in it we singles again but the closest stop to us so we were in Annick Northumberland the closest stop was like Leeds um so it was a bit of a drive like a 2 hour drive Anyone in the US watching is probably like, that's nothing. But to us <laughs> in the UK, that's like a that's like a big, big thing. So I remember asking my dad, we were on a holiday from school at the time, and we were like, Dad, would you, could you take us, could would you take us to this tournament in Leeds next weekend? There's a Pokemon tournament. Would you please take us? And he was like, I don't know, humming and hawing about it. And he said, I tell you what, okay, we've got a week. I've got a bunch of jobs that I need doing around the house this next week. You guys help me out every day with these jobs and we get to Friday and you've done a good job. We'll see about, we'll see about gone. So we were like, brilliant. Okay. Like we were both of us, like whatever he asks us, we are doing this week. And I'm pretty sure he knew that <laughs> <laughs> as well. So that, that week, he had us working like every day, like get up, get breakfast out, like cleaning windows, cleaning gutters, doing the garden, doing all the rubbish jobs that he obviously didn't want to do. Right. And we were working to the bone every single day. But like every night we would we'd get in, we'd have our tea, have a bath and stuff and be like, oh, tonight, like we're, we're definitely we're definitely gone. We've done so much work. So it rolls around to the Friday and we're like eating dinner and we're like so dad um tomorrow because he hasn't mentioned it the entire week either and it's kind of that point at friday night we should be all arranged for going in the morning and he hasn't even talked to my mum about it i'm like this is this doesn't feel right so i'm like dad the the tournament is tomorrow um we've kind of 
done everything this week. Are, are we going to be going to the tournament? Uh, are you going to take us? And he was like, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to have to speak to your mum. And I've never felt so <laughs> gutted in my life. I'm like, are you kidding? We've done like all this work <laughs> all week and you're, you're going to have to talk to mum about it. <laughs> and like we made an agreement. So anyway, he was totally winding us up on the wind up. He, he ended up taking us in the end, okay, we get, good. which was nice. So we left super early to get down there because it started very early. We got there. There was a bunch of people there and you had to queue up before uh, the tournament started. The worst thing was that it wasn't advertised what the format rules or anything like that were for the tournament, but it was just on gold and silver. So we get there and win the queue and then this rep for the tournament comes around and starts explaining the rules. And they're like, okay, so it's going to be played on the N64. We've got a lot of systems that are in the back of this. They, they had this big Pokemon lorry that opened up and there was loads of 64 systems in there. They're like, we're going to pay you up, but it's going to be played on stadium and you're all going to be using rental teams. And we were like, what? We've like spent months, like, well, not months, but we had really in total to build our teams, like taking such a long time to build our teams. We're like, but we've got, we've got teams that we can, we can play with. They're like, no, it's fine. Like there's, there's people here that haven't got teams. So we're, we're going to run and it's all going to be on rental teams. And um, yeah, it's going to be like best, best of one elimination. And uh, yeah, we're going to be starting soon. And we were like, are you kidding? So that was the first letdown with it um, that we couldn't use our teams at all. And then using rental Pokemon and I got cheesed out So in the worst way. So I thought, okay, I'll use one Buffet because against people that don't really know what they're doing, well, Buffet's a pretty good Pokemon, right? Counter Mirror Court. And if you know your special physical split from those games, it's pretty easy to kind of predict knowing what Pokemon's going to be out, what move to kind of lock into and you, you get through at least two of their Pokemon, hopefully, and then you've got two versus one, which is normally enough to kind of wrap the game up. So that was my strategy going into it. But I came up against the kid in like the second round and he was using um, a hound door against me. And he uh, all he did was bite against me. And because the hound door outsped my entire team, he proceeded to <laughs> flinch axe me out the entire <laughs> event. And again, I was like, I was so annoyed. I was so <laughs> gutted. <laughs> This kitty was like, I won, I won. I'm like, <laughs> you've literally just crushed my dreams here with a hound door. <laughs> was, was that like, a hound oh. door, not a hound doom? Yeah, it would have been so much better of a story, like acceptable if it was a hound doom. It was a hound door. <laughs> the, first, the first evolution. And because of how the rental teams work as well, it was like, because it was a lot of Evo, it was higher level. It was such a weird tournament uh, structure. But anyway... On the back of it, everyone that participated in the tournament got a, a pre-release copy of Crystal. Hmm. And on the Crystal were 20 Celebes on there uh, that you had to distribute to your friends. And then once you distributed them for certain Pokemon, you sent the cartridge back to Nintendo and then they sent you out an actual copy of Crystal. Um, but the, the copy that you got was an authentic version of Crystal. I shouldn't be admitting this on the internet, but I never sent my copy back. <laughs> I never traded those selfies out. <laughs> <laughs> but then the battery died in it and I lost everything anyway. So uh, uh, <laughs> you got your comeuppance in the I end. I got my cup opens. But that was that was the Celebi tour. And um, wow. yeah, that was uh that was a bit of an adventure. But um my brother didn't do too much better in that one either. No, but I think if we'd been able to use our own teams. Uh, that would have it would have worked out a little bit better, I think. But that is a that's an incredible <laughs> prize for participating. Yeah, it was you get just, a cartridge just... with, full of Celebes, yeah, which you can't normally get in the game. They were really like my brother did the majority of the trades for the Pokemon, so we had like most of them. But there were really obscure like trades that you had to make that you had to fill the box of twenty. And then send them back. If the Pokemon were wrong on the cartridge that you sent back, you wouldn't get the cartridge, the actual authentic version, which seemed really weird. But there was like you had to trade one for a Charizard. I remember there was like re like fully evolved Pokemon that you had to trade these Celebes for. Which, like looking back now, I'm like there was no need to make the list so difficult. It could have mm. just been anything. But uh, yeah. I know my brother brother did it, and then they sent him the um the actual cartridge, uh, the proper one. But do you think they were just like? 
they couldn't be bothered to get those Pokemon themselves in games. Just... <laughs> yeah, they're just like, yeah, we'll get these thousands of kids to the UK to do it for us. <laughs> Complete our Pokedexes for us. Thanks very much. <laughs> wow. That's um... Dennis, what do you need? Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Lee. So it's time for your second yeah. Pokemon on your dream team. Yes. What's that going to be? Is it, it going to be a Stella Zap- It's going to be Zapdos. It has to be okay. Zapdos. Yeah. It has to be Zapdos. I think because it was... I remember playing through uh, red, blue, and yellow and like coming across it and then catching it and then being realizing how powerful it was. I used it in that first team as well in the, the 2001 championships. And I feel like I've used it in any, any team that it's, it's been available for me to use ever since. Like any format, it always feels very, it's it always been a really solid Pokemon. Um, and I love it. It's, it's, yeah, it's just got, I've just got such a love for Zapdos, like not just competitively, but just generally because it's a legendary Pokemon as well. You know, we all love our legendaries. Mm. Um, yeah, and it's it's a bit like Tyranitar. It's been on a lot of teams. I've had a lot of success with. It just feels like a very safe Pokemon for me, and just something mm. that I, I always have a, a a bit of an affinity to. And it's a cool design as well. Oh yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. So I was going to ask, what is it that Zapdos has over? Articuno and Moltres for you. The electric stab. I mean, an electric flying type to start with. Back then, you know, when you you had like ground was the only. Mm. Uh, I think as a as a kid, being like, oh, that the it's got no weakness, you know. Well, it has got a weakness to obviously mm. rock and ice that it gets from the flying, but it doesn't have to worry about ground attacks at all, and it's just so strong um, on its special attacking side as well. So yeah, I think. Electric types I always really liked because it wasn't a great deal of choice back, especially yeah. in Gen 1. You had like Jolteon, which was decent. I mean, you really want... I wanted to use Pikachu and Raichu because of the anime, but I mean, if you wanted any success, you, you didn't use those Pokemon, unfortunately. There was Electabuzz, I guess, as well, but mm. outside of that, I mean, Electrode, potentially. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. You're right, yeah. Um especially yeah going back to gen one it is slim pickings for um quite a few types i mean now we have so many yeah um so many to fill out each type but um and you said you had red that was your first it was yeah first okay, okay red. Yeah. so that got was the exact box now oh wow <laughs> we got it yeah that's very cool and electabuzz yeah. i believe was an exclusive to red as well yes yeah um red? yeah i think it was okay. wasn't it and a magmar in blue i believe yeah yeah Hmm. Um, anyway, we're now going to skip forward, I believe you said, to 2010. 2010, my fil- first world invite I ever earned, which was... Because um, uh, VG c- kind of came back and was a thing in tw- 2009. So um, that story is a bit weird because I find out about VG, like the VGC tournaments with Play Pokemon two weeks before the uk nationals and i've got a copy of pearl still in its cellophane and a ds still in its cellophane and i haven't opened either that i got for my birthday and i'm like oh man i like so i hadn't played any of this generation and i was like i have to go to this tournament i didn't know tournaments were back because i'd taken a, a big break from after i'd say ruby sapphire emerald there was just no tournaments at all. And I was like, I guess I kind of got into playing music a bit more and, and doing a bit more of that with my friends. So I had, a, I played gaming a lot less than I was doing before. So um, I just, yeah, I just kind of, with no tournaments, I just felt like I had no drive to go and like chase down my, you know, the dream that I had originally with Pokemon. So when I saw this article and I was like, oh my God, there's actually a tournament. It instantly was like, I need to go and play this tournament. I need to like try and, and do good at this tournament. Uh, so I used those two weeks to try and get a team put together, try and learn all of the new Pokemon, all of the new moves, which uh, inevitably failed. Um, and I got <laughs> knocked out in round one of that year, um, which was again, to be expected. I didn't take it as hard though as um, I did originally because I just... You know, I don't think I had the expectations that I would have done well. And I think it was a good gauge to see where I needed to get to within 
the competitive scene that was there at that present time to do better and hope that there was going to be more tournaments the year after and it turned out there was and the 2010 um championships was actually gs cup so it was the first gs cup i believe that they they ever did was 2010 so that's two restricted but in your team you could have up to four restricteds so it's not like uh things of today's day sorry i'll just try and get my camera in focus if it's gonna focus so you could have like um, so on my team, I had a Kyoga, uh, Dialga, Palkia, and I can't remember the fourth restricted. I'm sure I had a fourth restricted. No, I didn't have a fourth restricted because my rest of my team, but you could have had up to four on there, but you could only have two in your team at once. There was no team preview back then or anything like that. Um, so whatever you had at the top two, you could interchange those and you could change the items on any of your Pokemon as well throughout the battle. So between rounds, you could change items on any of your Pokemon. Um, and you just put the ones that you wanted to lead with at the top of your your team and then you went into battle from there and then the second two of the other four uh, to make up the four so after 2009 i spent that entire year uh learning i guess getting into competitive pokemon again learning about it practicing and um getting a team ready for the uk nationals which came around um in may time in 2010 and i went and again it was it was a lottery system for getting in um and i managed i was there so early to birmingham i was like one of the first in the queue uh and got through to the semi-finals in that tournament um and then got, well ended up with top four finish uh, but uh and got my invite to worlds but sadly only the finalists got the paid trip to worlds and um yeah, I uh, I just didn't have the money to pay to go to Hawaii that year. So it was really, it was like a, it was a real bittersweet that year where it was like, I've got this, this world's invite, this thing that I've been wanting to, to get for the longest time. And I can't, I can't go. And it was, I remember it was the, the time around uh, Eurovision because I remember coming back and Eurovision being on the TV and I, I remember sitting and watching it and being so so sad just knowing that I wouldn't be able to kind of go on this trip to worlds um and kind of in denial thinking oh, I'll find a way I'll find a way but it never it never worked out and then um obviously missing obviously then with the community that there was on Smogan at the time people posting pictures of of their time out there in Hawaii that won uh, their invites and and maybe got just the invite and paid to go out it was like oh, i missed such a crazy time a really cool event so um it, i kind of doubled down really after that and tried tried even harder to chase to chase that goal to get to the world championships because again the format back then was pretty brutal it was like a lottery system to get in to start with and then it was best of one you know so if you got if you lost one game you were out of the tournament so you could technically go to round one get beat and that would be your run gone and that would be it so you you know there was no room for mistakes back then although the competition was arguably a lot lower than it is across the board now <laughs> wow um that's very sad very sad to hear mm. um but i mean again hopefully <laughs> now looking back you can think well i still did really well to reach where i did especially as you say when it's a best of one format yeah and i think it just drove me on to keep improving to where i i well i kind of got to in the end um because i i still had that kind of desire passion and love for the game like i had back in 2001 when i went to the first tournament and i kind of had that feeling again of you know when i said at the start of the 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 conversation about coming home and training that star me up i kind of still had that that feeling of almost i'm not kind of done i've, I've got a lot mm. more work to do like sort of mentality to it so i guess that drove me on a little bit but it took a complete u-turn really from from 2010 because 2011 rather than concentrate on my um playing and i hope you don't mind me going on this tangent it does all line up eventually <laughs> So 2011 black and white came out but rather than concentrating on my playing i actually started a a tournament series of my own in the uk uh called one up events and organized like a bunch of regionals throughout the um throughout the country uh with 
a, a national at the end of it, a big tournament at the end where we did the regionals and players that attended qualified for the top players qualified for the nationals and then the nationals, the big prize was advertised that we had was a, a paid trip to the world championships, uh, which was San Diego, California, anyway, somewhere there that year. Um, so that took up a lot of my time and uh, uh, it ate up like all of my savings as well. Uh, so that pretty much, it was a good thing to do. I think um, it was it was a real experience, but I, yeah, I, I think I only managed to get to the Madrid Nationals that year and I bubbled, I got ninth. So I didn't get, uh, I think top eight got invites that year mm. um, and I bubbled ninth at Nationals in, um, in Madrid. So I, I I just didn't have the time like I'd done the previous years to to put into the tournaments. And uh, it wasn't until 2013 when I really kind of um, got got third place at UK Nationals again that year. But that was the the year I eventually got my um my first paid invite to play at the World Championships, which was like honestly just the the moment was just. I can't really describe it to anyone because it, it feels kind of dumb saying it like mm. I, I was so emotional after I, mm. I got that placement and it was like, like, you know, t 13, 12 years of trying to get something, even though back in 2001, there wasn't a world to get to. There was, it was a different setup back then, but it was almost always the same thing that I'd been chasing and trying to claw at and fighting for and, trying to get good enough to be in that position to get it. And fortunately in 2013, I got a little bit of luck along the way. I think you always need a little bit of luck with these things. Uh, but I think the hard work as well can't be understated. I put so much work into trying to get uh, that paid invite to Worlds. And um, that ended up with me going to Worlds for the first time to play, which was like one of the most incredible experiences ever. And that was in Vancouver. So that was, that was, that was pretty awesome. Looking forward to hearing more about that and i mean it's cool that you um really cool that you were organizing your own tournaments as well i think that speaks volumes of of the kind of person you are but before you tell us about vancouver time for your third pokemon on your team who's joining tyranitar <coughs> and zapdos it is the one and only infernape infernape yeah nice okay how come infernape yeah i just love this pokemon so much i think it's again it's like a starter pokemon i love chimchar it's such a cute little pokemon but infernip is just i used it in 2010 on my nas nationals team that year and no one was really using it a lot of players were using like hip on top uh alternatively but i i loved infernip for what it offered to the team the fast fake out the uh, the strong close combat i used the mix set as well so i ran heat wave on mine as well with a sash you get the blaze ability activating for the heat wave um and then overheat as well it's like a big nuke if you needed to but it it won me it won me a really important set in uh top 16 at nationals that year with the uh, with the heat wave obliterating in a, a bomber snow and a dialga from mm. full health with the blaze um wow. active so it was yeah it's it's always been and it was like my main support to kyoga in that tournament as well uh, mm. So I would like scoff Kyogre. It was such a cheese strategy. It's like <laughs> fast, fast fake out, water spout, and just cheese my way through uh, the, the the early rounds of the tournament. But yeah, I I it's one of those Pokemon where I loved it that year, and it was really good in that format. And I've always I always wish I could use it in other formats, and I do try it mm. every new format it comes around where it's where it's available, but it's never quite reach the peak that it did back then but i still sure. love it it's one of my yeah. one of my all-time favorites you said that you um <clears throat> you sort of rushed through playing pearl in order to attend that tournament um yeah just in that those two weeks that you had did you choose jim char for that i did right, indeed I yeah okay. yeah that was that it was my start my first starter in in that generation so that's probably got a lot to do with it as well i think mm. um yeah, and it's cool. very like I'm a, I'm a I'm a sneaky anime Pokemon anime fan as well. Still, to this day. <laughs> isn't that it's, sneaky? I mean, it's yeah. not entirely surprising, <laughs> <laughs> but it's very cool in the anime. I mean, Ash's Chimcho, the whole whole kind of saga with it. It's uh, it's very sad and then satisfying how it ends up. Uh, okay. So that was, that's got a, a probably a little bit to do with it as well. Okay, so I'm liking the um, you've got some good tight balance going on as well on your team so far with Tyrannosaurus, Zapdos, Inferno so Rock Dark, Electric Flame yeah. 
fine. Looking at the rest of them, there's it's it's not bad overall balance. I haven't yeah. put it together as a balanced team no. or anything, but there's this I think, yeah, the rest of them. You just team build well in your sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I just, wish. Oh, I just came up I with wish. this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually, it's been like twelve hours just like, oh man, what can I do? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, so you've just got us through to Vancouver in twenty thirteen. Mm-hmm. Um, and that tournament was a, a phenomenal experience, but uh, I make some dreadful mistakes. I think almost because it was such a, it felt like such an achievement getting that world's invite. I felt like I'd achieved what I wanted to achieve that year, mm. and it was so so far from like what I really wanted to try and do, you know. And I, I tested a bunch of teams on the run up to worlds, and they were all very good. And I think they would have all performed really well at the world championships. Obviously, you can never say for certainty, but I think um, they would have been. Um, good teams to take into worlds because there weren't like anything that anyone else was playing at the time there were teams i tested in the online um tournaments at the time so we had like a you know the global challenges that we have now we used to have them quite regularly so um you know i th- I think it'd always be like in the top but it easy in the top eight uh the one right before worlds i finished second in overall globally um and I should have, I should, I, I, I have that huge regret and I hate that I have that regret of not taking that team into the tournament and just having a bit more belief in that team. And instead I got kind of scared last minute and I just went back to my nationals team that I ran and it was such a wrong, it was such a bad call because the, the format, the meta had changed so much between UK nationals and worlds. And yeah, I just didn't do well. I think I finished like three three that tournament so it was just yeah it was really disappointing well and although that didn't really cloud my experience or um, you know make it any less than it was because i got to meet so many players and and people that you know i'd read about in in war stories blogs and things like that online or chatted to online and i uh, actually got to meet them for the first time so it was it was really just an incredible experience but from a competitive side of things it was it was so far from what i wanted and i think that in turn made me a lot more prepared to try again and go back uh, the next day i I specifically remember on my flight back from vancouver like thinking i i've got to get back to worlds next year and i'm I'm gonna have a real go at it next year so that was my whole thought so again the cycle started Mm. going into the 2014 season wow yeah i'm trying to um so r- roughly how old would you have been in 2013? So I would have been, uh, what are we doing? So 2001 to 13, 26 ish. Uh huh. Yeah. And yeah. it's just, it's amazing thinking of how, um, I yeah, as you say, you there. just, you know, these names online and then you finally put a face, yeah. the person to the, yeah. I, I yeah. was trying to actually find, uh, cause I got, I got, photos from um the vancouver that year and there's some photos with like a very young wolf glick that year and stuff oh, like that i was like oh, i could have brought them on to this but i can't find uh the drive where i've got them but and like marcus as well that year mm. so um <laughs> but yeah sorry interrupting you no no that's fine that's um that's my thing and for anyone who isn't aware wolf glick is uh <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> one of the most Everyone's, famous. Everyone knows well Pokemon competitive, yeah, competitive <laughs> Pokemon players. But they didn't back then. He well, was exactly. like a hot shot onto the scene back then. Yeah, he yeah. was like, he, I think he broke onto the scene like 2011, yeah, and was just winning regionals, winning yeah, nationals yeah. that year as well, I think. And then because he had a, a great world, and yeah. then kind of went on from there. So he was definitely a player you had to have on your radar and watch out for. And then um, the Marcus you mentioned as well, Marcus Stata, a uh, European incredible player. player. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You well, you you know how much where I hold Marcus. He's mm. like he's one of the goats, Marcus. Mm. He really is. Marcus is uh, so. yeah. But I I had I'd met Marcus from nationals uh, through the European scene before then. But mm-hmm. I guess going to worlds with with that sort of cohort of players as well yeah, is kind yeah. of just like special, you know. Um, yeah, for sure. So wow. yeah, it was amazing. Uh, that was it was really it was it was yeah really really good so mm. yeah and there's there's a bunch of names i'm not mentioning there of course, of course in 2013 yeah. when i went it's the first time i actually met ray as well so mm-hmm. he's a an absolute top blog 
as well. Ray Rizzo, you mean? Yes. Uh-huh. Ray Rizzo, yeah, who is one and the three-time only. world champion. Yes. Again, for anyone who isn't familiar. Um, well, so from um, people friends, back to your Pokemon friends, who is your fourth member of your dream team? It's God of War. Mm, God Gardy. of War. Yeah. Generation three, fully evolved form of routes. Yes. Very nice. So how come God of War's there? Are you, when you when you asked me about this, it's probably not as much of a link back to any competitive reasons for it, but I always just, I love Mega God of War. Um, when we had it introduced in X and Y, it was just something that I used a lot throughout that season, not so much in tournaments, but I, I just, yeah, it was more towards the latter end and probably into uh, the following season when we got Auras uh, or Mega Ruby Alpha Sapphire. But I think... Um, yeah, there's just it's just one of my favorite Pokemon, so I feel mm. like I had to put it put it on the list. Its yeah, typing's yeah. great as well, especially when they introduced the fairy typing in uh, Kalos and X and Y. It just got that little bit better. So it was mm. like it was always a Pokemon I really liked, but with the um, the fairy typing when it got that, it was like mm. a little bit elevated. So yeah, yeah, there's not too many competitive stories. I did use it on my first team in 2014. It in Italian Nationals. And uh, that was in Milan, and I bubbled again there. I finished ninth in our, our side of the bracket, and um, I beat players that year. I remember playing uh, Matteo Gini, who was a previous, you know, he got um, two, no, three years before. So in 2011, he was a finalist at the World Championships, mm. mul- multiple national championships to his name, really high-profile player. And I remember bringing this team with... Um, People are going to judge me for this, but this is before it was like a thing. But um, I used God of War with Ally Switch mm. before it was before anyone else was using it. It was mainstream, and everyone was angry and mad at Ally Switch being a thing. <laughs> this is before all that. So this is 2014. Yeah. But I used Ally Switch God of War with um, a scarfed crocodile as my main kind of mod, so I could. Ally Switch and Earthquake and the mm. telepathy there with the God of War. <laughs> and I had like Mega Lucario and the team with Swords Dance Extreme Speed because then it gave me a way to set up a nuke Talon Flame before it could mm. get its Gale Wings. Um, Brave Bird off, stuff like that. It was a pretty yeah. interesting team. And uh, yeah, I, I finished X2 but bubbled on ninth from that one. So I didn't make it into top cut of that event. But that was wow. the, the only time I think that season that I used uh, God of War. That one wasn't a mega though, but I think yeah. that was before before Mega Guardi. But yeah, yeah. That's a really interesting team. And if you are not aware, Ally Switch, you switch places with in competitive Pokemon who've got two Pokemon on the field at once. Ally Switch switches those places, so whatever move was targeting one slot is now hitting the other Pokemon because you switch places. Um yeah, very frustrating strategy. I'm glad I wasn't playing you <laughs> at <Yeah>. that point. <laughs> it worked quite, um, quite well a few times. I don't yeah, sure. used it like every match, but there was a few occasions where it was, you know, the moment was right. To use yeah, it, yeah, but, yeah. Um, you sure. know, back then it was it was a lot different. There's not uh, open team sheets, so you could get away with those things. But, sure, uh, yeah. By yeah, the yeah. end of the tournament, though, you know, um, a lot of their little clicks at tournaments talk to each other about the different things <laughs> to expect if your opponent's got this and that. Yeah. So I think most of the, the field probably they were coming up against me knew about it. So I wasn't as yeah. effective as those early rounds where I was just like, ah, yeah, you go for that close combat in my crocodile. Yeah, it's <laughs> going to be into my God of War and you don't even know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A pioneer, Lee, as always. Um, so now I believe we're just going one year forward to 2014. Yeah, so that takes us to uh, Washington, D.C., the year after 2013. Um, I didn't get a paid invite this year to to uh, Washington, but I earned my invite through CP. So it was, uh, I think the first year they introduced championship points, um, the top 32 players uh, earned a, a, a place to play in the World Championships. So I managed to squeak in there and um, got my way over to Washington and... Um, yeah, I spent, it was weird, my team building running up to that event because I hadn't performed super well throughout the season and I'd been trying different teams uh, throughout the, the the various nationals that I went to that year and never really got further than top 16 in any of the nationals. Um, so I wasn't feeling 
really great, but the team I, I, I built going into Worlds, I spent a long time on, but it was all v very theory-based team building. There wasn't very little actual testing of the team. Um, and you know, playing Politoed, Ludicolo, uh, Godchomp, Tyranitar, Zapdos, and Mega Mobile. And the whole team was literally, like I said, theoried down on paper, books full of just like calcs and how the team would function and how it should function. And the only thing that I needed to get for the team was a hidden power flying Zapdos. And that was a really key, important member of the team to deal with um mega venusaur a lot better than than what my current matchup was so i had to reset soft reset for a hidden power fly and if you don't know how the the ivs are what determine a hidden power of a pokemon it can if your ivs are a certain combination either odd or even then it will determine what typing the hidden power is and the flying iv combination was a very difficult difficult one to get i think it needs to be like HP, attack, and defense needed to be all odd. And then your special attack, special defense, and speed needs to be even. So it had to be those three. I think there was another combination as well. But I honestly was soft resetting for this thing for two months solid. And uh, even on my trip to Washington was still soft resetting for it on the plane, soft resetting for it two days before the event. And the day before, the night before we had to register our team the next morning, I was still resetting for it oh, wow. and um with one of the the last opportunities the next morning before i had to leave i got the zapdos <laughs> and it had the worst iv spread as well but it was hidden path line so i was like i have to yeah. have to lock it in um it had like a zero special defense iv it was terrible mate and it's speed <laughs> iv so i had to rejig the whole ev spread as well so to make sure because it was really important to have a, a certain speed stat because I was putting the choice scarf on it. So it had to outspeed the standard Ludicolo in the rain so I could get a Volt Switch off before they could attack. And then I could get my Tyranitar in to disrupt the, um, sorry, my uh, camera's gone off, disrupt the rain before they could take advantage of it with their Swift Swim ability. So it was super important. And it hit the benchmarks with the speed. So I was like, I've got it, I lock it in, uh, put it together. And then we went and locked that team. So it was really last minute. And then the tournament started and it was, yeah, um, all, all uphill from there, really. It was, um, it was, yeah, finished five and one after Swiss got on stream round three, played Barish, um, which was hilarious. Cause for those of you that know Barish Akdos, he is a very, he's a larger than life character, an absolute gem of a person. Um, but he's a very confident person. He's like the complete opposite to myself. Like he is so confident as uh, in, in everything that he does. And I remember coming over to the table and I finished my round two and he was like, Lee, we're playing on stream next. <laughs> and I was like, oh, are you actually kidding? Because I played Barish the year before the 2013 uh, World Championships and he beat me and I was like, I don't need, I don't need this now. I've had a really good start to the tournament. <laughs> um, but thankfully my team matched up really well into his and um, he was playing like a Gothitelle trap with Mega Mobile, and because I had the pivot with the Zapdos and the the Discway combo, it made it very difficult for him to kind of get any sort of momentum swing in that game. So it went really well on stream, and then I progressed through. Um, my only loss in Swiss was to Colin Higher, which was a close game as well, and got through to top eight and lost to Judy Azarelli in top eight, but um, very close that year. But it was an amazing accomplishment, and I felt like I did a lot better. Just would have been nice to go a little bit further you know but i mean there's nothing to take away from your performance there is still i think i mean i guess you're the sort of person who will always think um you know you're a perfectionist but um yeah i mean hopefully now with a bit of hindsight you can think no i did i did a good job i think looking back i think yeah you know the tournament itself i i think Again, I got probably a little bit of luck along the way to, to, to get the results I did and get to the finish I did. But yeah, I, I am happy with how it went. There'll always be that question like, what if, you know, mm. um, what if I beat Judy and then, but you can never, I don't think it's, it's healthy to look at things like that. I think it's, 
better to look at where like and i i analyze that game so much afterwards and i still go back to it and look at it sometimes now to just remind myself like like this is why you didn't get any further in the tournament because judy played better than you and mm -hmm. there was opportunities in that game for you to progress but you just you didn't take those opportunities and i think it's good to look back at examples like that from you as a player to try and grow and get better so yeah i i yeah i look back at it as a very fond memory of course so. yeah 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 for sure yeah it's a fine line between sort of it can be painful i guess to look back and work out where you went wrong because you have to relive it but fundamentally that is how you that's how you improve i guess you get better now it's time for your fifth pokemon lee so so far reminder we've got tyranitar zapdos yes. infernape god of war who's number five Number five is none other than Garchomp. Garchomp. The okay. dragon ground type. Yes, mm. Garchomp. If you're uh, someone who's familiar with the older games, Garchomp is essentially the equivalent of Dragonite, but in Generation 4. So that would have been the sort of mid-2000s those games came out. Yeah. Um, so yeah, part dragon type, part ground type. And how come it's on your team? I... I... I don't think I could put a team together without Garchomp on it. I really got, I think it's just one of those Pokemon. It's a bit, I would always compare it to be like what Landorus was, I don't know, like pre Sword and Shield. So your, your Sun and Moon days, your, um, prior to that as well, like X and Y. Anytime Landorus was allowed in the format, it kind of took the place of Garchomp, what Garchomp did. It was always one of those like S tier Pokemon back. In, in all the formats just because of its speed started outspeed like a lot of the base 100 uh stat pokemon so it always had the jump on them and it was just very strong it had a lot of um uh, flexibility with how you kind of ran it as well you could run a sword stance on it you could run a substitute on it you could run life orb on it um yachi berry on it so there's loads of different options and of course in a and a close team sheet format it was always a tricky Pokemon to deal with and it could really punish very hard and especially Earthquake I think was just such a strong option back then I mean you could even run Choice Scarf on it and something like Rock Slide but it was such a mainstay in that really kind of I guess more successful time when I was playing I feel like it just always has to go on on my team pseudo legendary as well why mm, not gotta mm. throw the Garchomp in there it's just it's a land shark as well, really. I like, love <laughs> <at> the design. <laughs> it's very cool. So, yeah, it always. Well, let's be honest, everyone. It's a land shark. <laughs> it's a shark on land. <laughs> Everyone's worst nightmare. What well, not to love? <laughs> um, yeah, well, uh, that's entirely. That's that's a very good choice. And you've got. So that's a dragon type. You still don't have any um, duplicated types. I don't think. We've got Rock Dart, uh, Electrifying, Firefighting, Psychic Fairy, Dragon Ground. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing yeah. Um, conflicting yet. Okay. It's so, honestly not put together with um, <laughs> a lot of thought, <laughs> honestly. Well, no, it's it's uh, also you've, you've gone for very strong Pokemon. I didn't know if you know you go for like your very first first partner Pokemon that you chose mm. while playing through. But no, these are all <laughs> these are all heavy Pretty hitting strong. Pokemon. Yeah. Um, Okay, so now, um, I think the last topic that you want to dip into from your life experiences comes down to your first, it comes into your journey into casting, I suppose. Yeah. Casting Pokemon. So my first time casting was the Birmingham Regionals in 2018. Uh, so yeah, I got uh, asked, got reached out to, asked if I'd like to get involved the the casting team from becca um uh, i'm forever grateful for her and jay bringing me on board to the team and it was just such a different thing to do uh to what i'd been used to competitive pokemon and uh you know just going to events and playing uh but the broadcasts had started to ramp up uh, they did the full coverage of 2016 uk nationals the year before uh not the year before but the season before and um yeah, so I uh, got the got the opportunity to to go along and and uh, try the casting out, and I I loved it from moment one to right up to today. Uh, it was just such a great experience, and I feel so grateful for the experience to have been asked to um to get involved with the team. And it's been 
so nice to kind of see the development of it as well. Um, not only like the development of the competitive scene where it's come from from right back then, but from when casting first started to where it is now and the broadcasts and things, how they've grown in size. Yeah, it's it's been a really, really privileged journey to be on. Well, I mean, it's an entirely natural journey for you as well, Lee, as someone who's been playing competitively really since you were first able to. I mean, the tournaments you were talking about in 2001, they must have been some of the earliest competitive tournaments that there possibly could have been. So, um, yeah, and the level of detail that you bring to the casting um, cannot be understated. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's obviously it's something that you have a, a real talent for. And uh, I know plenty of people are very excited whenever you're on the casting desk. And frankly, I'm one of them. <laughs> Whether I'm uh, watching <laughs> or having the privilege to cast alongside you. <laughs> but, um, well, yeah, I, that's um, what a journey indeed. But then, so you had your first cast and then in 2022, you were casting the World Championships then. Yeah, I mean, that was that was incredible. You know, I always did casting, but... I'll get to this probably a bit later on with one of your questions that I have pre-prepared, but I never, ever, ever thought I'd get the opportunity to cast Worlds. And then obviously it being in London, um, got asked and uh, I can't, you know, like, you know that me and Lou have worked together for years and I, I just felt like kind of not to taking anything away from our other casters at all because, you know, it's phenomenal working with, the US team and I love any opportunity to work with them but it was I think a little bit more special that year because it was in London because of what had happened the, the the years prior to that world championships taking place and it felt like it was a, kind of like our little event between the two of us and it was just it's so special an event um I it was just absolutely incredible to do worlds as well in London like you know you just stack up all of these things on top of each other and it was just such an incredible opportunity and such an incredible event to uh to get to be a part of and it was just i yeah uh, probably one of my most favorite memories i've got um mm. from anything it far surpasses you know um any accomplishment that i've been able to achieve playing uh i think it was just yeah i, I like i say it's just a really real privilege to uh mm. to have been able to do that and be part of that whole that whole event it was just incredible yeah very special event indeed. I believe you. Um, it's still on your X profile. You still have that pinned at the top. Your um, mm. thank you for the world's experience. Um, yeah, I happened to see earlier today. Um, and the Ros and Sonia. Yeah, of course. Cosplay kind of between me and me <laughs> as well. I think. Yeah, that was a lot of fun as well. So dressing yeah. up as two of the characters from Generation Eight. Um, well, a fitting place to now ask who is completing your dream team, Lee. Um, it's been quite the journey with Tyranitar and Zapdos and Infernape and Gardevoir and Garchomp. But now, who's rounding it out? Comes back full circle to that dream-eating menace. <laughs> Bingo! <laughs> it's my last Pokemon that I've, I've picked for my, my dream team. <laughs> yeah. Very nice. It has to be real, doesn't it? When you said Dream Eater earlier on, I thought, wow, that's a real Generation 1 throwback. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, here to Quite stay. Quite move as well, surprisingly. For that, for, <laughs> yeah, it is. Time. <laughs> Very much so. You recover. Just got to get your the opponent to sleep, I mean. Yeah, you know, exactly. That's the hard thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Ghost and Poison. So again, unique types there too. Incredible. Yeah, it is, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's done all right on paper. What an... What a fascinating team. Tyranitar, Zapdos, Infernape, God of War, Garchomp, and Gengar. A few G's in there. A few Pokemon beginning with G. There's a lot of G's, isn't there? Yeah. GG's. <laughs> <laughs> the perfect use of that. <laughs> Speaking of GG's, Lee, now I'm going to ask you if you were to choose one of these Pokemon to be your partner. You know, we know that Ash has Pikachu. Which of these six Pokemon is your partner Pokemon? <sighs> have to say Tyranitar. It would have to be Tyranitar. Have to be. And I could ride on its back as well when it walked around, so. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so, yeah. Be quite yeah. a quite a high climb. It would be. Up there. Wouldn't it? Quite but it's almost like it's, it's got the spikes on its back, so it's like yeah. a, a, ladder, a ladder system, so. Yeah, true. You could also get a, a saddle made for yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> Imagine that conversation going into the saddle shop. Hello, good sir. Do you um, make saddles for Tyranitars? <laughs> <laughs> Picture having a straps around us. <laughs> As I was there. Okay, so now, Lee, what I'd like to ask is slightly more abstract. If you were a Pokemon, mm -hmm. what do you think you would be? So I answered this. I, I, I spoke to you before just to clarify the question. So I originally thought this was, uh, if you were a Pokemon, what would you be? As in, what would you like to be? So I've got, I've got two answers for this, because if I was a Pokemon, what <laughs> do I see myself being as a Pokemon? Uh, there is it's two parts to this. So I'll answer the first one as I originally answered it. If it was a Pokemon, what would I like to be? And that would be Celebi. That was my answer for that because and I could time travel and I could see all of mm. these cool things in the past and I could, you know, go to the future. It would be kind of cool jumping through time yeah. and uh, who doesn't want to be a little green onion mythical Pokemon as well? <laughs> <laughs> so that would be my answer for that. But the, the actual answer... Um, what do I, like, if I was a Pokemon, what do I see myself as a Pokemon? The, the only Pokemon I could see myself being is uh, from a particular animation. Have you ever seen a Glade run before? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Scarlet uh, and Violet's probably a vaguely. good... Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. And it's it's kind of lanky and, and, like, yeah, it was... I was I, I I yeah so I'm gonna I'm gonna say I'm a, a Galad. <laughs> so based on how it runs, <laughs> yeah, how, uh, <laughs> how it looks so goofy when it runs, yeah. It's <laughs> gonna be a Galad. So Galad. <laughs> not that I want to be a Galad, but I could see myself being a Galad. Yeah, so I th it's just it's interesting that that <laughs> it's the running animation that you're mm. zeroing in on. Yeah, <laughs> there. I spent many um, an hour watching that Galad. <laughs> laughing at it <laughs> wow um that's interesting i mean i was thinking like you'd be thinking about what type you think you'd be and based on that but no it's just <laughs> just how good no, i didn't know yeah. we're going this deep with it <laughs> okay edit this out okay so the type that i would be um <laughs> no no that's a good answer and then glade is psychic fighting yeah Interesting. I'm not really a fighter um, though, so no, I'm not. I'm not sure I call you a fighting type. Um, what's that? I could see you as a water type. I could see you as a. I could see you as a. Um... Like this answer better. <laughs> <laughs> water and hmm, maybe a ground. Water and ground. ground, like a swamp pet. Yeah. You could, yeah, you could be a swamp. I could see you as a swamp bird. So I'm basically a, like a swamp monster. Well, some might say Gastrodon, <laughs> but let's go with swamp bird. No, I could, I could see you as a swamp. Bird. I like Gastrodon, but it's not the best looking Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's, it's, swamp bird, it's, be... <laughs> it's quite, it's it's mighty, and uh, and yeah, with that ground typing, it's sort of um, yeah, it's it's a it's also it's wish a solid as well. It's a solid bloke. Yeah, yeah it could be wish gash. I don't know. I quite, I quite like the swamp bird thing. Swamp bird. Um, it's a so what it do you a think? Solid bloke. Yeah, I like, I like, yeah, your, yeah, I like yeah. your answer. We'll take that. So okay. we'll go edit bird. all the other I things know. out. Uh, Charlie, I, I, I see myself as a swamp bird, a ground <laughs> and water type. <laughs> How did you come up with that? <laughs> um, <laughs> but I can, I can see the Gallade as well. But what do you think? What type do you think that Lee would be? Drop a comment. It would be interesting to hear. Based on everything you've heard about Lee, it would be interesting to hear what type you think Lee would be. Um, and now, got a few listener questions. I say listener questions. No one's heard this podcast yet because <laughs> we're recording in <laughs> advance. But do have some questions submitted from people um, that I'd be interested to get your perspective on. So, first of all, this question comes from Gabby Snyder. Mm. Gabby Snyder, of course, a uh, Pokemon caster for the video game scene over in the North American scene. Hello, Gabby. Thank you for your question. Kick it off nice and easy. What's your what's your favorite sandwich, Lee? Favorite sandwich? That's not an easy question. That's a <laughs> that, that's such a difficult well, question. Mean... <laughs> More quick fire, I guess. <laughs> okay, favorite sandwich. I would say a tuna melt is probably one of my favorite sandwiches. Tuna yeah. melt. Yeah. yeah. That's tuna yeah. with like red Tasty. onion and cheese mm. melted on it as well. So very like nice. a panini, a panini kind of a tuna melt panini. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Mm, I like it. Good. Pineapple on pizza, also from Gabby. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Hundred percent. Mm. Mm -hmm. So all, 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 always good. Case closed. 
fair enough. Um, <laughs> our question here from Teacup VGC. Do you play any of the instruments in the background of your videos? You mentioned earlier that you were playing music with friends as you were growing up. You're quite a musical person. What instruments do you play? I play piano, guitar. I, I can play drums. Not very well, but I can play drums. And um, I, I been known to sing a little bit. I used to be a front man in a band, but it doesn't mean I'm good, but I used to be. <laughs> mm, uh, so okay. yeah, primary, primarily um, guitar, piano and, and bass as well. That's one there. So oh, yeah. that's a good selection. And uh, yes, the, um, the, the, the track, uh, the, the outro to my videos on my YouTube channel, uh, that was all played by me. Yes. So very cool. Yeah. Very cool. That's, uh, I won't make you sing now, but that's. Um, I was about to get the guitar really... out and everything here. <laughs> I can't get my camera to focus. It's really annoying tonight. This light is just not doing well. If it focuses in on my hand, and then I'm really sorry to the viewers ruining your first episode that's why we Sorry. love we love to see that love to see that um from man in a band as well that's uh that's really fascinating yeah i what still sort of can't believe that now what were they thinking <laughs> <laughs> allowing that to happen <laughs> <laughs> what sort of music did you did the band play uh, we started off as a punk pop band so like in that genre of like blink one it two kind of green mm. day yellow cards and you found glory very fun a beat sort of stuff mm. and then went down uh, a bit more of an alt route from there. So it was a very much inspired from punk pop, but went down to be a bit more, um, I guess, a bit more into the emo kind of route of things and um, with a bit of a, a metal influence as well and, and some places because we had one of the guitarists mm. in the band uh, and a few of the others liked liked that kind of harder music. So that kind of came into it a bit. So mm. got a bit of a, a, a screamo vibe as we progressed on. So eventually wow. but uh yeah it was uh it was a lot of fun a lot of fun yeah yeah yeah, yeah. maybe we'll get you singing on the casting desk at some point sing your commentary bangers yeah 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 thank you for that question teacup vgc yeah, thank you. question from nido rich what's your favorite memory at a pokemon tournament favorite memory i'd say that the 2013 um Getting that paid invite has to be, mm. has to be, because just the emotions that I, I went through and even to expand on it a little more there, not too much in detail, but I, I remember going to a corner of the, the hall after winning my top eight game and getting that. And, and, and it, like, it sounds really like, I don't know. I just had, I was so emotional at the time, but there was a few tears at that point, just being like, I'm mm. just, just almost relief at that stage. Just being like, I can't mm. believe I've actually finally done it you know finally gone to world yeah. so yeah one of uh um but like from a playing perspective that's one of my favorite memories um, completely understandable something you've worked so hard towards um thank you for that nido rich and fi final listener question i can't believe i'm about to ask this but uh, here we go i could not <laughs> joe brown another <laughs> na uh caster for the video game hello joe thank you for this this excellent question so you're playing in the England World Cup final in football. It's currently a nil-nil draw, 92nd minute. You're doing a penalty kick. Do you kick left, right, or straight down the middle? And also, Machamp is the goalie. I have to go straight down the middle. Machamp's going to dive one way or the other. He's been looking at my eyes the whole time, and I've been throwing him that way and that way. And he's going to dive, and I'm just going to bang it straight down the middle. It's going to go in, and we're going to do a big Alan Shearer esque celebration yeah. afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> That's really interesting. I because I've I've been mulling on that question as well. Mm. I'm thinking, my champ isn't a very fast Pokemon, mm. so I'm thinking you go for one of the sides because it's not going to be able to move that mm. quickly. Yeah. And let's assume it's let's assume it's right handed. I know it's got four hands, but let's assume both on the right are. The stronger ones. If you go for your right, Summer Champs left. I reckon then you might have. Maybe you're going through the legs of the Machamp if you're going down the middle. Yeah, it doesn't look like it can bend down very far, you know. True. Yeah. True. Yeah. I'm relying on the Machamp to dive one way because because of its, yeah. its lack of its speed, it's going to have to launch itself and commit yeah. like 
like you see a lot of goalies like they'll commit to one side they'll have yeah a detailed report in their head that they've been told off their scouting team or their assistant coach before the game. This guy <laughs> always goes down the left. This guy always goes down the left, dive to your left. And I'm going to be looking at the right to throw him off to say that I'm going to the left. And he's going to be like, he's looking at the right. He's definitely going left and he's going to lunge to the left. And I'm going to right. just yeah. boot it as hard as I can down the middle. And then right. we're going to win. And yeah, we'll be okay. champions of the world, and then Queen's gonna play, so and there's gonna be fireworks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wow, best night of <laughs> our lives. <laughs> Love how the level of detail you've reflected on that question <laughs> is uh, quite staggering. Real philosophical questions coming out here. Thank you, Joe, for that. <laughs> for you, that Joe. suggestion. <laughs> so, Lee, we've heard your story up to now via the football pitch, apparently. And what I want to know now is what's next for you. So uh, I went, uh, actually took a big dive last year, uh, personally, to uh, go full time uh, with my YouTube channel um, and quit my job that I was working in. I wasn't super happy working in, in, that, in that job any longer. And I've been kind of thinking about it probably since the start of the year last, last, last year, uh, so 2023. Um, but I've been putting off. I just, I didn't know if it was the right thing to do. It was a big step for me to, um, take that, that jump and, and do it. And, uh, after a conversation with my brother really resonated with me, he was like, what's the, what's the worst that's going to happen if you, if you do it, it's like, you're not happy in, in your current job. And, um, it's like, what, what happens if it doesn't work? And I'm like, well, I guess I just find another job. And I think that just that having him say that to me was like just the you know when you hear the the perfect thing at the right time that was that and um i then handed my notice in and uh then that was that and uh, yeah so basically i've been doing that ever since alongside obviously the casting as well which has been a lot of fun and um being able to put a bit more time into preparing for the casts as well recently with with having a bit extra time I don't have that kind of nine till five because beforehand when I was doing the nine till five or um, seven till five, because they were my hours because uh, I worked like 10 hour days um, and then fitting YouTube around it as well. It was really difficult. So um, it's just meant I can sleep properly now, which is a lot healthier for me and have <laughs> a bit more time to actually concentrate on some other things, which is good. Um, mm. But yeah, so I think just I've got a few things lined up with YouTube. Um, I, I want to, uh, create a new channel specifically around competitive Pokemon, uh, to go along. So I like run alongside my main one, um, and just hopefully, um, <clears throat> keep doing the casting. It would be amazing to keep getting us to uh, come back to events and, you know, be alongside the likes of you, Ben, Costa, <laughs> Lou, David, Marcus, and everyone else that we've got on the team. And, um, any opportunities with our NA casters as well. It would be, it would be amazing. So hopefully that continues as well, but they're, they're where it is right now. I've not got anything mm. too much further ahead, uh, planned at the moment, but, um, yeah, that's kind of what I'm looking to do at the moment. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. <coughs> looking forward to seeing your new YouTube channel get kicked off as well. Um, yeah, I'm excited for it. Focused. It's going to be yeah. a bit different from, because my channel originally started as a VG channel. It yeah. was so centric around VG. And then it's slowly moved away from that and found its its own space in the Pokemon world doing slightly different things. But the heart yeah. of it, I'm a VG player, so that's what I love to sure. do. And I think I've learned a lot on the journey to where I've got to now that I could uh, come back with a different way of producing content that'll be uh, a bit more digestible to not mm. just vg people but to the wider the wider audience as well but um brilliant. i think it's going to be more of a, a a passion project rather than anything that i think is going to do well you know but uh you'll, we'll see where it goes as long as people exactly watch it and enjoy it that's the main thing yeah don't know where it's going to go until you start exactly sure. um finally Lee, last question i want to ask you is looking back to a younger version of you the you back in who started playing Pokemon around the age of 12 and discovering early tournaments with the Celebi tour and things like that. 
compared to now, the Lee who is creating fantastic YouTube content, casting events, what's the one piece of advice you would give to a younger you? I would have to say, and it's still something I struggle with every day uh, of my life and have done, is have more faith in myself. I am such, I am not a confident person. I have like very little confidence in myself. And I think that's probably one thing I would try and go back and tell a younger me, just have a bit more confidence in yourself and belief in what you're doing. And I think, yeah, that's probably the one thing I would say. Got no regrets about anything where it's led me or anything or the path to get me where I am today because it's wouldn't change it for the world. But I think that's the one thing that might have helped me in a few situations along the way, just having a bit of belief and a bit more confidence in myself and a bit more conviction behind what I kind of want to do in life. So that would be, mm. yeah, the one thing I would I'd say. So like I say, I struggle with it still now. So I try mm. and get getting better, but... No, still, mm. still one of those things I think that I'll always battle with. But um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, very touching words indeed. Thank you for your honesty there, Lee. Um, and I'll hold you to that. <laughs> thank you, Turning my friend. The future. Um, well, Lee, thank you so much. Now, the, the chat doesn't actually end there. If you, uh, I'm about to ask Lee some bonus questions that he has not prepared for. If you want to hear 15 minutes or so extra uh, content, questions like what trainer class does Lee think he would be from the games? Bug catcher, ace trainer, that sort of thing. Um, uh, classic Bulbasaur, Charmander or Squirtle. Biggest celebrity Lee's met, things like that. Then... Um, Hop on over to Patreon and you can support me and the podcast and everything else there. Um, any subscriptions, hugely appreciated, of course, but also thank you so much for tuning in to the podcast. I, I appreciate it very much indeed. Lee, thank you so much for joining me and thank you so much for the care you've put into all of your answers. It's been brilliant to have a little bit of a peek behind the curtain at you. Um, and again, an honour to have you as the very first guest on the show. So thank you. Thank you so much, Charlie. Again, thank you for uh, having me on, asking me, especially to be the first guest. It's a huge honour and it's been an absolute pleasure as it is every time that I get to chat to you, mate. I did uh, have one thing, if you didn't mind me mentioning... Yes um before we headed off i am um, i'm doing a, a a big kind of like charity thing this year um so for the whole year i decided at the start of the year 2024 that there is a trust called the little princess trust here in the uk they make um real hair wigs for children that suffer with um hair loss due to cancer treatments due to alopecia other things that can cause that and so they make the wigs. So I decided at the start of the year, this whole year, and maybe into a little bit of 2025, uh, I'm going to be growing my hair to a length where I can then donate it to the charity. Um, I am got a. I also have a GoFundMe page uh, at the moment, um, so you can you can visit that. I don't know if Charlie would mind me putting it in the description or in a comment down below. Uh, where you can go and i'm trying to raise because the wigs cost 750 pounds to make for the the company though and they make them free of charge when people donate their hair but the one thing that i wanted to do at the very least was donate my hair and then try and raise uh, an additional 750 pound uh to go with my my hair and, and and donation so if you you can give anything i know it's really tough times at the minute but anything you can spare to support the cause and help raise awareness around this brilliant charity it would be very much appreciated and thank you for the opportunity to share that charlie no thank you for sharing it it sounds like an absolutely wonderful charity and definitely do go and check that out they will be linked as lee says so you'll be able to go and take a look at that and if uh, lee if people want to keep up with you online where can they find you uh over on x what we're calling twitter these days it's the elon <laughs> um, you can find me at oh, at osiris vgc is my handle over there uh, you can follow me on my YouTube channel, which is just Osiris at Osiris on YouTube. And um, they're pretty much the main places that I uh, I post and I'm active. So probably the best ones to advertise. Oh, put out there. Advertise. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Make sure you go and follow Lee, especially if you play 
the main series games because the guides that Lee does are really, really useful uh, to get the very most out of the game. And uh, if you want to stay up to date with all the latest news to do with the podcast, they can follow at Chizindra Chats on X, on Instagram, on uh, TikTok. And then my own account is Chazingra on all those places as well. If you've enjoyed the episode, please do leave a like, subscribe, drop a comment. This is my first time saying any of this stuff, and it feels like I'm joining some kind of cult. <laughs> there we are. Um, <laughs> because it really does help out. This is, this is an idea I've been brewing for quite a long time, so it feels really good to be finally getting it out there, and I'd love to know what people think. Fundamentally, I just want to make the best podcast that I possibly can. So... Uh, any feedback you have, really, really appreciated. And also, let us know in the comments anything you've learned from Lee's story. Um, again, what type of Pokemon you think that Lee would be, but also things that resonated with you from what Lee said. We would, both of us, would really love to hear that. Um, now, my guest next week will be the legendary trading card game caster Shay Burton who is a lot of fun uh Lee I know you know him as well that's going to be that's going to be a lot of fun that episode that's going to be awesome you've got to tune in for it Shay is an absolute <laughs> legend he is a legend and that podcast is definitely one that I'm looking forward to already so yeah cheers brilliant <laughs> already know like we'll mention when's uh when's Lee and Shay's next adventure going to be happening mm. <laughs> <laughs> that could be a good well be, I'm going to get a question and if you play putting out questions yeah 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 that in. <laughs> <laughs> well in a different kind of way it's going to be happening next time so um make sure you're tuning in for that and if you have any suggestions for guests then do let me know on any of the social media above and all the links are going to be in the description along with my patreon um because based on my background, obviously, I know people from more the competitive side of the community, but of course, Pokemon goes far beyond that. Um, if you know anyone in the community who you think would be a great guest to have on, maybe someone who makes YouTube videos, someone who uh, shiny hunts, things like that, then do let me know. I'd love to for the podcast to have as broad a range of guests as it possibly can. Uh, you can email chazindra at gmail.com or comment, find me online, all of that sort of thing too. Right. It's time for these bonus questions, Lee. And if you're not joining us for that over on Patreon, then it's going to be goodbye from Lee. Bye-bye. And goodbye from me. We'll see you next time on Chazingra Chats, where there'll be another six Pokemon, one life story. So then, Lee, here we go. Are you ready? I am ready, mate. I am okay. more than ready.